So now that we know how to go from a Boolean expression to a circuit or from a circuit to a Boolean expression, let's talk about simplification. So uh, we've already used one form of simplification and that is to use the laws of Boolean algebra, like we take a Boolean expression and, and we can use the laws of Boolean algebra to simplify that Boolean expression. And here's an example of that. Well, this is one we've done. So here we had this expression and we could build a circuit with that expression and this is what it would look like if we just took that expression and built a, directly built a circuit. But we know about simplifying this and we were able to walk through those uh, steps using the laws of Boolean algebra and we ended up with this much simpler version, right? That was just the complement of x times y. And now if we take that simpler version and make it a circuit, it's a much simpler circuit. It uses half the number of gates. Um, it's much simpler. And this becomes a big deal when you're doing circuits. It's quite easy to write longer Boolean expressions. It's more complex to build circuits that have more gates and connections. Another way to simplify is with Carnot maps. And these let us simplify Boolean functions. Remember that a Boolean function can be represented as a table. And so we can use that with Carnot maps to do simplification. So what a Carnot map is, is it's a special arrangement of a truth table, and it's a visual way to group terms with common factors. So the way that things group when you map it onto a Carnot map helps to reduce the factors that are going to be used in the expressions. And it helps to eliminate unneeded variables. Now here's some examples of maps. These are empty ones, but it just shows you the difference between Carnot maps with different number of variables. So a Carnot map with two variables, we're going to be getting all of the values, right? We need a combination of all the zeros and ones for every input, no matter which size of Carnot map we use. So for a Carnot map where X and Y, where we just have two variables, uh, X can be zero or one and Y can be zero or one. And there's four different options for that. And so there's four boxes right? And that's when we have two variables. If we have it in a truth table or an input output table, it has four rows because there's four different combinations with two variables. Now, if we do a Carnot map with three variables, then um, X has to have all the values zero and one. And then across the top, we have to pair it to stay two dimensional. If we could go three dimensional, we could, but to stay two dimensional so we can keep it on a piece of paper to look at it, then we're gonna combine the Y and the Z. And when we do that, to give them every combination, then there's four labels, right? There's zero, 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 one, 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 and one, zero. Now notice this is a different order and we'll talk about that more in a minute but we have all the combinations of Y and Z, and then we combine them with the different combinations of X and one, and we end up with eight boxes. And that's how many different values there can be when we have three variables, right? When we have a table with three variables, it has eight rows for the different combinations. When we move to four variables, then each side has two variables, so each has four combinations, and then we end up with 16. And if we had a table with four variables, it would have 16 rows to identi identify every combination. And so with a Carnot map, we get exactly the same number of combinations as we do with a truth table or an input-output table. 